Hello, today we are discussing family communication. This is for my uh, communication 203 course, which is, which is interpersonal communication. So the way that I divide this course up for everybody who's not currently enlisted in my course is we run through various forms of one-on-one -on -one interpersonal relationships that people might have throughout their lives. So we start with friendships. Uh, we work through, we're working through family communication right now. Uh, we will do intrapersonal communication. So how do you have uh, views about yourself and then how your own views about yourself sort of manifest into uh, relationships with other individuals. And then we end on romantic relationships. So today we're gonna discuss family communication and why I think family communication is one of the most important forms of, family communi uh, of communication there is as far as your interpersonal relationships. And on the last slide, there will be some uh, links uh, and I'll put them down below in the YouTube comment section where you can go and you can watch a couple clips from the film, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, that sort of walk us through a couple of these uh, family conflicts as well as how they resolve the issue. So I want to start off with a story. Um, a couple of years back in 2016, uh, right after the presidential uh, election of Donald Trump, um, I got into a conversation. It was not an argument. It was simply a little conversation I was having with a former colleague of mine who was upset about the election. Um, him and I were not talking about the election. What we were talking about instead were our Thanksgiving plans. Now, this was an individual who, in the immediate aftermath of Donald Trump's uh, winning the presidency in the first and second week of November, was going on and on about, we need to reconcile this country, we need to start reaching out to people who are thinking different than us, uh, people who might have uh, xenophobic views or fears of the other. Um, there was a lot of division, uh, not just politically, but um, uh, you know, issues on immigration, for instance, with Donald Trump's mantra, build that wall. So this was an individual who was very in tune with the politics. He was very uh, active in saying, okay, this is a time to reflect. Uh, he was not, uh, he did not vote for, for Donald Trump, but he was definitely on board with the sort of conversation that everyone was saying that we need to have now that this um, anomaly happened that nobody had predicted, including the polls, all right? So after a while of talking to him um, casually about the election, we changed topics and we started to discuss uh, just Thanksgiving plans. And in the aftermath of him talking about how we need these larger conversations, I said, okay, you know, just on a different topic now, uh, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? You know, are you going home for Thanksgiving? Because he lives uh, back in the Midwest. I'm on the East Coast. We're, we're both on the East Coast. And when I asked him, you know, are you going home for Thanksgiving this year? His demeanor changed. And his demeanor changed in the following ways. He says very aggressively and very assertively, no, I'm not going home for Thanksgiving. You know, everybody in my family voted for Donald Trump. I can't even look at them or talk to them right now. And I'm just going to stay here on the East Coast. This was the first time that he had never gone home for Thanksgiving. And he was very adamant about not sitting down at a table. And ironically, not talking to people who uh, had voted differently than him and had different political beliefs than him. I was a bit um, interested in his response. Um, I didn't say much about it, but sort of in this moment, all I could think about was this is a very intelligent, uh, academically minded uh, individual. And he had just given me all of the good cable news talking points about talking across the political divide, um, having these larger conversations with people who are different than him. Um, and he could not even afford to sit down at a table uh, with his own family members uh, who he already had a relationship with. Um, because he was concerned that they had voted uh, differently than him and they were sort of just you know Midwest conservatives, all right, uh, who had voted for Donald Trump. So I'm, since then, I've been very interested in this phenomenon uh, with when it comes to communication scholars in general who have these larger conversations or who, who, who promote the idea of let's have larger conversations with more people and pull them into our conversation about, you know, politics and social issues and culture and race and the, the, the rest of it, um, uh, who then when asked if they would sit down at a table with a friend or a family member, or if they would even have a conversation with someone who had different politics or beliefs in them, um, they are very assertive in, no, I'm not going home to thanks for Thanksgiving this year because I am so upset with the results of the election that I cannot look at my uncle uh, who might have voted for Donald Trump. 
Um, there seems to be a disconnect for, for all these individuals who want us to have these larger conversations, uh, who are themselves unwilling to have conversations with people sort of in their own families. But they want me, for instance, to go and have a conversation with strangers all over the United States um, you know, about you know, the state of the country with regard to you know, politics and the rest of it. So that's what kind of pulled me into this interesting thing with regard to who are we supposed to have conversations with and who should we really be fostering strong relationship ties with. So there's a couple of things that I have sort of ran down here on the left hand side of uh, the PowerPoint, right? So the first is this number right here. We have a 168 hours in a week. 168 hours in a week, a third of that is spent sleeping. You know, you have a lot of other time sort of spent at work um, that's more engaged with work. So you really have this larger question of, you know, how many hours a week do you need with a person, one-on-one, -on -one, an individual, in order to have a functioning relationship, in order to say, you know, I'm actually, you know, friends with that person. Uh, this is a person I would call at two in the morning if I got a flat tire. This is a person who could call me at two o'clock in the morning if they got a flat tire, all right? Um, we get very stuck on quantity when it comes to relationships. We have words uh, like, you know, friending someone on Facebook, right? We turn friend from a noun into a verb. Um, we talk about our Twitter followers as if those are um, deep connections when really it's just sort of like a, a, a ticker on a screen. Um, and the reality of the situation is we can only have so many relationships that can be important to us because we only have so many hours of the day and relationships are built on time spent shared experiences with other people. You can't have shared experiences with other individuals if you are not spending time with them. So there's this uh, well-known number, um, and it kind of, kind of comes out of sociology, anthropology. Uh, it's known as Dunbar's number. Um, it fluctuates some, but most people sort of see it as an acceptable idea uh, with regard to human relationships. So what Dunbar's numbers posits is that there are about 150 people who we can actually have some sort of close, uh, familiar relationship with um, at any given time, right? Some people estimated it might be as high as 500, but even if it's as high as 1,000, um, which is a lot, um, we sort of recognize that there is this sort of like finite limit to how many people we can actually engage with and say, you know, this is a sort of a true friend who I have a deep relationship with. Um, so when it comes to Dunbar's number, he sort of pulls this out of some, you know, you know anthropology, some, some sociology, as far as, you know, how did humans used to move around? We were very tribal, uh, you know, the hunter gatherer sort of evolutionary, you know, how did, how did people move and how did they keep these sort of close knit uh, connections with one another? So I become very interested in this back to my, friend who refused to go and see his family at Thanksgiving. And again, thinking, you know, these are individuals who get on cable news and talk about how the entire country needs to have all these large conversations about all these big political issues, um, as if I'm supposed to go and solve all the world's problems with a stranger that I've never met, who it might be, you know, culturally, politically, racially, uh, ethnically different than me. I'm supposed to do that, right? But these individuals who are the sort of quote unquote experts on, you know, polite conversation or uh, productive conversation about, you know, difficult topics, uh, these individuals, um, at least one individual that I know, uh, is unwilling to go home uh, for Thanksgiving and talk to a family member um, because that family member happened to vote differently. So I think there's some cognitive dissonance here um, that I become that I became really interested in. And so this is where I sort of started to dig more into uh, family communication and why I think family communication is important. So if you're in my class, this is these are some exercises I'd like you to do for the next couple slides. And we're going to run through these pretty quickly because there's a larger point at the end of this, right? So if you're in my class, I just want you to think about you know, what are the five to seven family relationships that you have? Discuss them in terms of how close and intimate they are. So maybe you have uh, one of your siblings you're extra close to, maybe you're not so close to, you know, mom or dad. Um, you know, are you, are you close to one particular grandma as opposed to a different grandma? Um, think about how communication happens with that person. Does it happen face-to-face? -face? Does it happen through text message? Um, are you a person who, you know, every morning you text your mom, you know, and say, hey, you know, good morning, mom. Um, do you might have a sibling that you only talk to once a year at Christmas, right? So sort of figure out how these relationships work um, and sort of discuss, you know, what topics are talked about in that relationship. Some relationships might be very surface level, you know, 
hey, Merry Christmas, hope your job's going well. Some of them might be a lot more, uh, might be deeper when you sort of talk about, you know, uh, people's marriages and their personal life. So just sort of recognize that all your family relationships um, have varying degrees of closeness and intimacy with regard to how you communicate, how often you communicate, and the topics uh, that you communicate. With regard to building strong family relationships, what keeps families together? Uh, it's mostly the sort of um, shared goal mentality. Now, when it comes to small, families a small group, right? So when it comes to small group relationships, there's two ways a small group functions. The first is that that small group could be task oriented, which means they have to accomplish uh, some sort of professional goal. So if you think about a, a, a group at work trying to sort of put together a product uh, to sort of ship out, that's a task oriented group. Another group, right? So this is, could be a shared goal too, is a group that is put together for relationship means, right? So one thing that we all need as humans is human connection. So just because it says shared goal, a goal doesn't have to be accomplishing a task. A goal could simply mean we need strong bonds with other individuals who we know are gonna sort of help us throughout our life. Again, the people that we can call at two o'clock in the morning when there's an emergency, we have that human need and connection for it, all right? So how do you maintain these things? Again, we go back to the slide where it says, look, there's 168 hours in the week. And this, these things take time to sort of form tighter bonds. So your family might share meals together. Uh, you might have family game nights. You might say, look, every Wednesday, everybody put your phone away for two hours. We're gonna you know, play Scrabble or Monopoly. Uh, every night at dinner, everybody put your phone down. We're gonna have dinner tonight every night from six to seven or whatever it is. But time is important when it comes to fostering relationships, which again, we go back to Dunbar's number, why um, you know people who adhere to Dunbar's number are interested in the ways in which people are constantly trying to accumulate uh, numbers of friends and followers on social media, as opposed to you know what that means with regard to our intimate, the depth of our relationships, all right? So we should be striving for the depth of our relationships and those relationships, they take time. It takes time to develop those things. So don't get so caught up in, you know, I have a thousand Facebook friends, get caught up in what is the quality of those relationships as opposed to the quantity. Now, when it comes to dissolving relationships, if it is a task relationship, all right, not family now, just a task relationship, me and my small group of individuals at work our relationship might dissolve because the product has been created and shipped and now we are on to something else. So the relationship dissolves because the task is over. What's different about a family oriented relationship, right? And this could play into some, you know, close friends, et cetera, right? What's different about a relationship oriented small group, right? When it comes to family is when it comes to dissolving, it's usually because you start to attack people's integrity and all of a sudden, you have a small group that is based on winning and losing as opposed to maintaining the, uh, as opposed to solving the problems, all right? So this is where we're at here. When you're, in a, uh, when you're in a family relationship, all right, you want to make sure that you um, are not attacking the person, right? So you don't attack the person as opposed to attacking the problem. If you do attack the person as opposed to attacking the problem, that relationship could dissolve. All right, so you and your family have money problems. If you start attacking the person as opposed to the problem, how can we solve this as a family? Um, if you start attacking the person, all of a sudden, people are going to feel like, you know, you don't respect me. You know, you think I'm toxic. This, this clearly has to be over with. So when it comes to family-oriented problems, you want to focus on solving the problem as opposed to winning the argument. And the reason is this. I'm not interested in quote unquote winning the argument because then all of a sudden what that means is that I live with a bunch of losers, right? So that's how these sort of arguments work, right? Not only do I not, I don't want my family members to feel like losers. I also don't want to sit there and be surrounded by losers. All right. So you have to make sure that you're constantly working on, there's an argument, there's a conflict in the family. We need to maintain it. We want to keep the family strong. So when it comes to those struggles and those conflicts, instead of saying, you're a loser, I can't believe I'm related to you, right? Or if it's some sort of romantic relationship, you know, you're a loser, I can't believe I married you, right? When you do that, all of a sudden you have a winner and a loser in the household, that's never gonna work, right? 
And at the same time, you're not actually solving the problem. So anytime your family has a conflict, strive for solving the problem where everybody's going to win. All right. There's a problem with money. If we can solve it together, guess what? All of us are sort of sharing that money anyway. All of us are sharing the household. All of us are sharing the burden of being a family and moving through life. So we want to make sure that we're all winning in this scenario. All right. So make sure you attack the problem. Don't attack the person. You shouldn't be calling your siblings names. You shouldn't be having these fights with your mom and dad that are ad hominem where you're attacking the person as opposed to the problem, right? You want to make sure that at the end of all of this, the whole family is winning because you're a part of that, you're a part of that family. And you don't want to sit there and say, I'm a part of a loser family. You want to say, I'm a part of a family. We have conflicts like every other family. We're going to solve these problems. Some more things on family maintenance, all right? Do you have a current family problem? If you're in my class watching this YouTube clip, you can think through these questions. So if you have a current family problem, what is it? Can you point to a specific time when it happened? Could the problem be solved, right? So if it can't be solved, you might as well ignore it, right? But if it can be solved, it's like, well, you better get busy solving it right now. So we get down here to this little scenario, all right? When it comes to fixing family problems, Either fix them or don't fix them, but either way, just stop talking about fixing it. All right, so this is the whole Yoda situation, you know, you know, do or do not, there is no try, right? It's like you're either going to go ahead and pick up the phone and call your parents and figure this out, or you're not going to, but either way, make a decision if you're going to solve the problem. So because you're with your family, your entire life, a lot of us get stuck in this mentality that we have more time. I can call next week. I can call next month. I'll see him next Christmas. In 10 years from now, maybe this will get worked out, right? So that is a different type of relationship than when you're at work, right? Or you're moving through school, right? If you're moving through school, it's like me and my friend have a limited amount of time to fix our relationship because eventually we're going to graduate, all right? So there's, a, there's an end point to school, right? There's an end point to your job. With your family, we're with them all the time, so time just seems very, very stretched out. And what people end up doing is they fall into this trap of thinking about fixing it, talking about fixing it, making these big, long plans for how to fix it. And the truth of the matter is you either got to decide I'm going to fix it or you're welcome to decide I'm not going to fix it. All right. And maybe you might have to live with the fact that there's just something in this family relationship that is unfixable, that you're not willing to put in the effort in order to have the conflict in order to fix it. That's totally acceptable, right? Plenty of people just say, I'm not going to worry about that. But either way, you want to make sure that you decide, are you going to fix it or not fix it? Because you need to get it out of your head. Otherwise, you're going to sit there and you're going to brood on it for years and years and years and years and years saying, maybe I'll fix it, maybe I won't. So if you have a family problem, figure out what is it? Do you want to fix it? And if you want to fix it, make a plan, set a time frame for that plan, and get busy fixing it. And if you decide, you know what, this is so long ago, it's not even worth bringing up anymore, then you say, I'm not going to fix it, and then you got to let it go, all right? You're no longer allowed to just kind of stew in it for a long time, all right? And this is part of your sort of semester-long projects as well, right? So it's like you figure out a relationship that you uh, want to fix, right? And now you have 16 weeks throughout this semester to make yourself a plan and say, I'm going to fix it, you know, by Christmas break. And it's like you're either going to take the initiative to fix the problem or if you don't take the initiative, you at least have to recognize, you know what, that's on me. I never took the initiative, so I'm just going to have to let it go. I'm going to stop talking about it so much because I made the decision to not address the problem. All right. A few things you can do here with family maintenance. All right. Four steps. The first is be the bigger person and make the first uh, make the first move. So a lot of times when I talk to some students or I talk to friends about uh, situations they have with family members, um, they get a little bit um, upset uh, because someone else isn't picking up the phone. You know, they say, you know, uh, my, my older brother mistreated me uh, when we were back in high school 15 years ago. And you know what? It's his job to pick up the phone. He should be picking up the phone and apologizing for it. The truth of the matter is your older brother might not think it was a big deal. Your older brother might not even remember it happened because it happened so long ago, right? At some point, somebody in this relationship needs to pick up the phone and make the first move. So my recommendation is, look, if it's bothering you, you need to be the one to pick up the phone and make the first move, right? And if you don't, otherwise, 
you know, you, then don't put the burden on the other person. The relationship is clearly fractured because both people ha are not addressing it and talking about it. Somebody's got to break the ice. It might as well be you. All right. Put it in your lap. Make the first move. Now, with the making the first move, you also have to be prepared for the fact that the other person might not be open to hearing it. Right. If the other person's not open to hearing it, you might have to let it go. You might have to say, you know what? At least I tried and you can take some comfort in. I was a bigger person. I tried. I have peace with myself. But when we talk about stoicism in this class, I can't control what the other person does or doesn't do. I can only control my actions. If I'm able to make the first move, I'm going to make the first move. I'm going to say what I need to say. If the other person doesn't respond, that's not on me. All right. So make the first move. Second, be direct. All right. Don't fall into habitual communication uh, with regard to habits and topics. So, for example, you might have a conflict with your mom uh, that goes back to high school. All right. Maybe, you know, some long standing argument with your mom. And every time you try to start talking to your mom about it, she might change the subject and act to, you know, how is college going? How's your girlfriend? How's your boyfriend? You know, are you moving? You know, what's your you know, job like? All this other kind of stuff. All right. But you need to be direct. So don't allow um, the conversation to fall into the, the, the habitual conversations where you're just talking, you're having small talk, you're talking about the weather all the time, right? Set aside a moment and say, look, mom, I love you. We can have small talk some other time, but right now, you know, we, we always talk about my college, but right now we need to talk about X. And the only thing that I'm willing to talk about right now for the next hour is X, is this conflict that we need to work through? And I would like to stay on topic, you know, and if we go off topic, then, you know, I need to walk away and maybe come back when we can be on topic, all right? So be very direct with what it is you want to talk to this, this family member about, you know, when it comes to um, navigating conflict. The third thing, set boundaries, all right? So this is important. So, so you're around your family most of your life. These are the people who are with you your entire life. Your siblings are going to be your longest relationships. For most of you, they're going to be your longest relationships for your life, right? Your siblings are going to be in your life longer than a spouse, longer than your kids. You know, your siblings are going to be there your whole entire life, all right? So what it means to set boundaries, all right? Make sure that you set specific time and place to talk about the conflict. And again, don't stew on the conflict the other hours of the day. So let's talk about some like intrapersonal kind of stuff when it comes to like crisis management for yourself. If you go through like a really tough breakup, all right, uh, breakups can be tough. You don't want to be in a position where you are thinking about the breakup 24 hours a day, seven days a week. What you should think about doing instead is, you know what? I got a job to do. I got to work out. I got to, you know take care of my like personal health and hygiene, right? So I'm going to do, and I, and I need to have friendships. So I'm going to do that most of the day. But you know what? Every day from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So when I get home, let's say for two hours, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., I'm going to allow myself to listen to super sad music and put on some candles and look at old scrapbooks and cry into my pillow from six to eight for two hours. I'm going to allow that, right? And there's nothing wrong with allowing that as long as you tell yourself the time and place is six to eight p.m. in my house, on my couch, in my pajamas, and then at eight o'clock, guess what? You're done. No more, no more crying until the next day at six to eight. And maybe you do that for like a week after the breakup, and then maybe you say, okay, the time and place now is like six to seven, so I cut it back for an hour. And then eventually you say, okay, just on like Friday afternoons from six to seven. So I'm only doing it like once a week at my house. Then eventually you get it to like once a month. And then eventually you say, okay, I've, I've set boundaries long enough to sort of deal with my personal, uh, my, my, my personal sadness and emotions. And now we've kind of like moved past them and I can get on with my life. All right. So set good boundaries uh, with regard to your own personal time and uh, time and place when it comes to dealing with your own hard emotions, right? So I'm not saying don't ever have emotions. What I'm saying is be very specific with the time and place so that you don't stew in it 24 hours a day for months on end. 
The same thing is true with interpersonal communication, interpersonal conflict. So you might say to your mom, mom, we need to talk about this situation that, I, you know, this childhood trauma that I have, right? Um, so this is what I need from you, mom. Um, I need two hours of your time when I come home for a week over Christmas, but I, you know, but the, t the place will not be on Christmas morning, right? The time will not be on Christmas morning. So December uh, 27th, let's wait until after Christmas is over. December 27th, you know, that morning before I get on a plane to fly back out to wherever I'm from, for two hours, I need us to just focus on this problem, all right? And that's it. So if you set good boundaries, then you're not going to ruin all of Christmas with your entire family by bringing up childhood trauma for a week and a half, right? Um, and having this sort of thing in the back of your head. But if you make a schedule with your mom and say, look, I know you want to talk about family and my job and how wonderful and lovely Christmas is. That's cool. We can talk about all those things, mom. And I promise I won't bring up all the other nonsense, but you know, for two hours on December 27th in the morning before I get on a plane, like we need to address this problem. All right. So make sure you're setting boundaries because again, you're with your family all the time and you don't want to be stewing in conflict all the time. There's going to be conflict, but you just want to make sure that it is appropriately addressed with regard to time and place. All right. And then finally, respect. So what does the other person need? Again, this goes back to I don't want my family to be a bunch of losers, so I'm not going to treat them like I'm winning and you're losing the argument. I'm treating this as we're all in this together. This is sort of like this is my community. This is my tribe. And I want all of us to solve the problem together because I want all of us to be functioning, right, and have, be in a good place. So make sure that you're addressing the other person's needs, right? And also realize, you know, for my college students here, that you and your parents are both adults now. So your relationship has changed. All right. And again, like these family relationships are your entire life and you change. You definitely change as a person throughout your life. So recognize that your relationship with your siblings is going to change. Relationship with your parents is going to change. Uh, eventually you're going to have children. Those are going to have ups and downs as far as change and, and, and the evolution of change. All right. So just because you knew your sibling in high school, right, let's say five years ago in high school, you and your sibling have both changed. If you and your sibling are now in college, right? Um, maybe you only see your parents once every three or four months. That's a different relationship than seeing your parents every day. So don't just assume that your parents or your siblings are the same people they were 10 years ago, right? Make sure that you're addressing your need, their needs and figuring out who they are today, not who were they when the conflict started when you were 14 years old, all right? You've changed, your parents changed. So make sure that you sort of respect the new needs of who that person is today, as opposed to who that person was back when the conflict possibly started. Finally, we'll do this quickly. All right, we go back to this initial question. Why is it important to have a good family life? And the reason is there's only so many hours in the day and most of them are with your family. All right, so you might unfortunately hear some stories of people who, um, don't like their family situation too much. Um, possibly, you know, it, uh, when you get older, your friends might be, you know, kind of perturbed with, you know, married life or, you know, they're like, oh, the kids killed my dreams kind of kind of talk. Um, but you have to realize that these are the people who are in your life. Most of your day is going to be set, spent with family. So you want to make sure that your family relationships are strong. All right. You don't want to. This is what you don't want to happen. You don't want to sit in a family life for um, a year and then say, I cannot wait until that one week over Labor Day weekend when me and my bros go to Las Vegas for a week. And then the other 51 weeks of the year, you're just miserable because you're around these people that you don't have a good relationship with. All right. So when people put all of the hope of their life and I can't wait until that vacation happens, you have to realize like you are wasting 51 weeks of your life on the chance, on the possibility that you're going to have one fun weekend in Vegas with your bros, right? This also works into like your workspace relationship. When people say like, oh, I don't like my job. I don't like people I work with. I can't wait to, you should foster really solid relationships with your coworkers. Because again, why would you want to sit around and have a terrible, terrible time for 51 weeks just looking forward to maybe one fun week out in, you know, Vegas or down in Miami or, you know, wherever it is you and your, your, your buddies are going. 
So don't sit there and dwell. This is what you should do. Take stock of how many hours a day you spend with people. So you have a coworker. How many hours a day do you spend with that coworker? How many hours a day do you spend with your spouse or your girlfriend? How many hours a day do you spend with your parents? How many hours a day do you spend with your siblings? How, figure out, make a list of here's all the people in my life. How many hours a day do I spend with them? And then you should be prioritizing how much effort you're going to put into making that a good relationship based on who you see the most. All right. Don't sit there and say like, I can't wait to see my buddy from high school who I haven't seen in three years, right? Because you're gonna be wasting all of this other time to foster good relationships. You don't wanna sit in terribly managed relationships all year long on the chance of seeing one person for a nice weekend, you know, one time a year. Make a list of everyone you hang out with, how many hours a week do you hang out with those people? And then that'll give you a good sense of like, okay, you know, even it, let's say it's your boss. I hang out with, I, I'm around my boss 30 hours a week. That better be a functioning good relationship. Otherwise, 30 hours of every week of your life is going to be hell, right? I'm around my spouse, you know, I don't know, 100 hours a week. You better have a good relationship with your spouse because you do not want to spend the majority of your life around someone who, you know, it, it's awful, all right? Fix those close relationships that you have a lot of time with on a day-to-day -day basis. The last thing, and all of these are in the comment section below on this YouTube clip. So if you know anything about It's a Wonderful Life, this guy right here, right, George Bailey, uh, he has a bit of a crisis. Um, his, he, he keeps getting set back in life. He plans on traveling the world and he plans on moving out of Bedford Falls and he's gonna go have this wonderful life and he just, his dad gets sick and his dad dies and so, George Bailey has to take over his dad's business. And he's like, okay, after I get the business established, then I'll move. He gets the business established. And then they're like, no, George, you have to stay. So he just, and then he ends up getting married and they, they buy a house and they settle down. And eventually, you know, he's got a couple kids and he's got a wife and he just has this huge conflict moment where he just gets upset. Cause he's like, I didn't fulfill my life. I didn't travel overseas. Um, I didn't go on these big adventures. I was going to, you know, go everywhere. Right. He basically feels like he got stuck in Bedford Falls around his family and all these friends of his in Bedford Falls. So you can watch the conflict where he has this huge blow up with his wife and kids, or, you know, um, there you have it, right? The crisis moment, um, and th these are the titles of the YouTube clips. So the first one is falling apart. The crisis moment is where he says, you know, he wishes that he was never born. So he attempts, he, he, he goes out and he's, he's gonna commit suicide, uh, but he has this whole moment where he's just like, I just wish I never been born. Um, and then the angel takes him around and shows him, you know, this is what life would have been like if you weren't born. And here's all the people that would have missed you and life would have been very different. And then the ending is the resolve, right? Where he sort of, where he starts to realize, um, oh, he's like, I did have an effect, a positive effect on these relationships. And I should have spent more time taking care of my wife, taking care of my kids. The people in my community do like me, right? So it's this mentality of take care of the people around you. Don't sit there and say like, I, I need one more Facebook friend who lives five states away and that's somehow gonna make my life feel better. People go chasing after the quantity of their friends as if one person who lives on the other side of the country, adding them to your Facebook friend list is somehow gonna make you fulfilled. And the whole thing with It's a Wonderful Life is like, no, George Bailey. It's like, you got family here, you got people here, you got friends here. Take care of those relationships because this whole like the grass is greener on the other side. If I was just friends with somebody who's not in my immediate circle, things are gonna be great. It's like, no, you have people in your immediate circle. Take care of them. You have a wife, take care of her, right? You have kids, take care of them. Like you don't need to, you know, run out, right? Uh, so if you think about like Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman, which my class will be reading soon, um, this doesn't give anything away, but uh, quick spoiler alert, Willie Loman, he has this family life and he ends up and he goes and he has an affair. Right. He's like, I just, he's like, he's not taking care of his family. Instead, he's like, I got to go find some other woman to, you know, to, to love me. Right. Um, he has this rough thing with his kids and he's like, I wish my kid was like the next door neighbor kid instead of my, the kid I have right in front of me. And this is sort of the lesson of, of George Bailey and it's a wonderful life. It's like, you have people around you, take care of those relationships, quit wishing that you had more and more people on your Facebook friend list and just take care of the people in front of you. All right. Um, go ahead and make sure that you watch these clips if you're in my class uh, and you can see some of it. Hopefully you all have seen It's a Wonderful Life. It comes on at Christmas time.
And for those who are in my class, uh, these are your five uh, quiz questions. So um, you can pause this video, check it out, um, email these quiz questions to me, and I will see you during our discussion on Friday.